Stick around if you want to learn how to get more views on your videos, words that you should never use with your customers, and why they're probably not buying from you. We'll see you guys in the interview. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the One Percenter Podcast. I am back with Sam, and we're excited for today, guys. We are very excited. We have the billion-dollar copywriter. We have one of the best salespeople, one of the best minds of persuasion, and, and just creating an amazing offer, guys. Welcome, Craig Clemens, to the show, man. Thanks so much for being on. Hey, right, thanks, guys. Pleasure to be here. Love the show, and excited to contribute some value. Hopefully, it's fascinating what he does, man. Yeah, you know, we always say, man, you're one copy away from your next million dollars. You know, like that. you know, and uh, you know, I've seen some of your work. You know, how did you become such a great copywriter? Because that's a skill that is not naturally comes to. I mean, I know not not to me. You know, so what what did you have to do to? to get good at copywriting. How, how did you get introduced into copywriting? Well, I started off as a really crappy copywriter. So I had that going, you know, I was in telemarketing before I was writing copy, selling all kinds of weird shit, like tools and industrial supplies, mortgages, credit card merchant accounts. I even worked at a place where we would help used car dealers sell their cars in a way that was shadier than they normally do. God. So do things called slasher sales where they're like slashing prices and, you know, putting a, a free car advertised in the newspaper and everyone shows up wanting the free car. And then they try to sell them every other car in the lot, you know, it's a wow. uh, crazy, crazy times. And I got really fortunate. I have a friend of a friend. Uh, his name was Evan Pagan. And oh, he's yeah. one of the, the early online publishing companies. Yeah, he was selling dating advice books. Yeah. He was selling books that showed guys how what, to meet what, girls. What was his, what was his name, uh, his alias name? I forgot. Yeah, yeah it was David D'Angelo. Yes, David D'Angelo. I remember, I remember like, you know, that, that was like, that was where there was a pickup artist game and dating advice and all that. I remember back in the day. That's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah, so we had a mutual friend that introduced us and I remember I was working at one of these crappy jobs and I hadn't talked to him in a while and we got on the phone and he told me he was making $4,000 a month selling these eBooks, which was a ton of money for me at the time. I talked to him a month after that. He said he was making $17,000 a month. A month after that, he was making $70,000 a month. I said, all right, man, I'm going to come work for you. I'll make your coffee. I'll shine your shoes, whatever you need to do. I'll just, just tell me how you make all this money selling these eBooks. And he said, ha, 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 thanks, but no thanks. And I went on his website and I saw he was sending out these newsletters that you could get for free if you just put in your name and email address. And there was dating tips and advice in your email box. And I'm reading these things. And I'm like, okay, I could probably write one of these things. And so one day I sat down and I wrote one and I was careful to write it in his exact style, which was very conversational. It was a writing style I hadn't seen before. It was single sentence paragraphs and asking questions and you know very high value with bulleted point lists and things like that and so i tried to write it exactly like him because i thought i could get hired as as like his clone you know i didn't even know the words copywriter ghostwriter i didn't know what any of that stuff was and i wrote one and i sent it to him i'll never forget it was called two tips to kiss a girl not the greatest headline but you know got him to open it up and he wrote me back he said okay now we can talk <laughs> and he gave me a job, $3,000 a month, which was life-changing money for me at the time. <laughs> and my job wasn't a copywriter, though. He hired me to answer customer service emails. And there's two types of customer service emails. They were emails that said, hey, I can't download this ebook," And those would go to the tech person. But the ones that said, hey, I'm thinking of buying this, but I'm 35 years old and a little overweight. Will this help me? Or I'm thinking of buying this, but... I just got out of a 20 year relationship and I don't even know where to start with the ladies. Will this help me get my mojo back? And so I'd write those guys back and be like, yeah, actually there's a page, uh, page 20 as a confidence exercise you could do every morning. That's going to help you with girls. And if you don't like it, write me back personally, I'll give you a refund. So I was learning what the customers wanted and getting inside of their heads. Mm -hmm. And that was something that ended up being a huge advantage for me when I did start writing the copy, because I got to talk to all these customers and find out why they were buying these eBooks in the first place. So that was my start. And yeah, I was doing customer support emails. And then eventually I started managing the affiliate program, which was finding other people to promote the books. And 
I don't know how long you guys have been in e-commerce, but do you guys remember when people would trade links? Yes. Yeah. So it was like to get you ranked up in Google. Justin, you're probably too young to remember this, but yeah, that was, that was about when Google, yeah, Google, yeah, with Google, you trade links. Oh yeah, back in the blogs and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the more sites you had linking to you, the higher you'd rank on Google. So my job was customer support, and then find people to trade links, and convince them also to make those links affiliate links. So instead of just linking to wdata.com, I would say, you know, want to learn to get the women of your dreams, go here, and then we give them an affiliate commission also. So I didn't write copy for about two years, but I soaked up everything I could about marketing. And Evan was buying me copywriting books and sending me to marketing courses. And I heard about this copywriting thing. I heard about Gary Halbert and I was reading his newsletters and it fell out of my reach. But as I kept working in the company, I started really just enjoying it and I tried it on the side when I would throw a party. So I'd, I'd throw a party in San Diego. I was living in San Diego with my, uh, my buddies who went to college. I, I didn't go to college. I barely graduated high school, but I was living down there and going to all the college parties, even though I didn't go to the college, <laughs> throw my own parties. And when I would throw a party, I would write the invitation in, in that Gary Halbert, David D'Angelo writing style where I'd be like, if you're ready for the most exciting party of your entire life, then this is going to be the most important email you open up today because we're going to have this, you know, 17 kegs on the beach and a DJ and all this stuff. I do it like bullets, you know, well, but you've got to be here at this time. And if you're late, you might not get in and the cops are going to break this up for sure. So make sure you're here by 10 PM, you know, cause you're going to want to tell all your friends about how wild and crazy this party was. So that's what I was doing on the side and it was getting a great response. A lot of people were showing up to the parties and people were saying, hey, this is the best party invitation I've ever gotten. And that gave me some confidence to actually write sales copy. And one day Evan asked me, he says, hey, we're doing a presentation or uh, uh, a live program. And he wanted me to sit in the back of the room for three days and take notes to write bullets. And it was about online dating. It was about meeting women online. And bullets aren't something that people talk about in copy that much anymore because it's kind of carried over from the direct mail days when everything was mm -hmm. on a printed page versus today when it's digital and it's often in video. But the bullet points are those teaser points that make people so intrigued they can't not buy the book because they need to know what, for example, is the, the seven words to whisper in a woman's ear that'll have her asking you for your phone number. They're like, what are those seven words? You don't need to know that. So he had me sit in the back and craft bullets around the content he was putting out in the, the program on online dating. And so I'll never forget, I wrote down, I got to like 80 bullets and I cut it down to the best 40. And I sent it to my boss, who was the CEO of the company. Eben was like the chairman. And I said, hey, Rob, before I send these to Eben, will you let me know which ones are the best? Because I got it down to 40. I only want to send the top 20. And I want to really blow his mind. And so Rob writes me back and he says, hey, man, uh, honestly, I don't think you should send any of these to Eben. They're just not very captivating. Um, I was devastated. I thought I was writing good bullets, but they just you know, weren't building that curiosity. And so I decided to look at other people's bullets, particularly John Carlton and Yannick Silver. And I looked at the formulas they were using to sell their stuff. And I plugged in dating advice. So Yannick Silver, for example, was selling business programs at the time. So he would have something and it would say, the, the three sentences to put on your sales page that'll double your conversions. And Yannick, Yannick has had, back in the day, had a great copywriting course. He did. I don't know if he still has it. I don't know if he still has it or not, but that, that copywriting course, I think that's where Joel Marion um, learned how to write copy and so many other copywriters. Yeah, yeah. Yannick's a great copywriter. And I was just looking at his sales page. I didn't have the course yet, but I looked at the sales page and he had something like, you know, the three sentences to put on your sales page to double conversions. And so... I looked at the stuff that I'd written about meeting women online and I used the formula. So I said the three sentences to put on your online dating profile, that'll double the amount of replies you get from women. And I just went through looking at all the formulas he used and I just 
kind of stole the formulas and used them for the dating advice. And it punched up the bullets. It made them good enough to actually send to Evan. And it taught me what was behind writing great bullets and building that curiosity, just looking at his example. And those ended up being acceptable and they put them into the big sales letter. But um, it was, it was a, still another six months before I wrote something personally, top to bottom, that they sent out to the email list. Wow. How did, so I had a lot of work to do. How did that perform, your first one? It actually did very well. I did have an advantage. So I've been did a monthly interview series. And unlike the podcast today, back then you had to subscribe. So you paid 30 bucks a month and you get a CD every month. Yeah. You guys remember what a CD even is? <laughs> you put it in your car player and it plays the, the podcast, right? So Evan wanted me to write the sales letter for that every month that would get people who had bought the dating books to sign up to receive the CD every month for 30 bucks. And he had one coming out and he had recorded two interviews and they were both a little shorter than the hour length that he wanted to uh, have every month. So he was doing a double pack and he said, Hey, you can write it for this double. So I had a little bit of an advantage. And then I got to write it for the first monthly one. That was going to be two CDs that they got, you know, instead of one, but it was the highest selling promo that had gone out asking people to sign up okay. for the monthly three series. So when you're going to start putting together an offer like that or a complete length sales letter, where do you, where do you personally start and where should people start? Yeah. So they should start the same place I started at the company, which is figuring out what the customers want and why they're buying. Because as, so I'll tell you another story. I was at a, uh, another conference or something and John Carlton was speaking. He's one of the legendary copywriters. And I got up and I asked him a question. It was Q and A time. And I forget my exact question, but I'll never forget his answer because his answer is something I think about almost every time I write copy. And he, he said, Craig, you know, what you need to remember is no one cares about your dating advice books or your courses. What your customer wants is to take a pill and wake up next to a hot blonde. They don't want to read a bunch of books. They don't want to learn a bunch of techniques. They don't want to go through all this stuff. They just want the end result. They don't care about your product or service. And that's true really in every business. People are thinking before they make a purchase, what is this going to do for me? And I got in a little debate with someone on Twitter recently. He said, that not, that's not true. You know, there's great brands like Prada and Paddock Watches and Starbucks. Those are the three he named. He said, those, those things are, are brands and people want the brand. And I said, nope, people buy Prada for status. They want to have that status of the Prada bag. It gives them a feeling of status. They buy Paddock because it gives them a feeling of accomplishment. And they buy Starbucks because they, they get the consistent experience of going into the Starbucks, they know they're gonna get a good cup of coffee and they know they're gonna get their butt. So they're all thinking about what is it gonna do for me? And so if someone's gonna to put together an offer, think about who your customer is going to be and then dive in where they are. That could be on Reddit forums. Um, if it's a company that has customers already, look at the customer support emails that are coming in. If you can even get in there and respond to some people or talk to customers on the phone when they're calling in, that's even better. I have all my copywriters at my company go sit in the phone room and listen to calls as they're coming in, listen to who the customers are. And then when I teach a great exercise that Eben taught me, and that is to put yourself so deep in the customer's shoes that you can write an autobiography as your customer. So take 15 minutes and start off being, you know, with a journal and say, hey, my name is John Smith. I'm 45 years old. I was married for 20 years. I have three great kids and I just got divorced. I'm on my own now and I need to start dating again. And I don't know how. I don't want to go to a bar because I feel like I'm too old. I don't want to do online dating because I feel like I'm not handsome. I'm not rich. Uh, I know I'm a nice person. I'm a good father, but I feel like women are going to feel like I have baggage because I have three kids, you know, and just keep going and get into all these emotions that your prospect feels. And then at the end of that exercise, sit down and write to that person. Now, now what do you say when people, people say my product isn't just for one person? It can, you know, so many people for Sam, he has gyms. So many people need to go to the gym. It's not just for one person. No, but you want, you want to speak to them. You want to speak to them individually. Like for example, when we do ads, you know, we have a separate ad for men and separate ad for women. 
You know, you know, you yeah. want you want you when you write in copy, you want to you want to just have one avatar, one particular person, you know. And even though you might have a broader product, you know, but but the marketing and the copy should be. Should, am I right? Yeah, it's a good question, you know, because there are different levels, and that's a great point, Sam. That if you're selling to men and women, sometimes you'll have an uptick in conversions if on the first page you ask them, "Are you a man or a woman?" and then you give them an individual piece. The mistake a lot of people make is they try to be too specific when they're describing the problem scenario. So let's say that you're selling a fitness course and you're selling it to women who want to get in shape before, uh, for summer or something like that. Right? So what an amateur copywriter might say, they click on the button that says I'm a woman and they get the page and it says, Hey, have you ever put your old high school prom dress on and noticed it didn't fit and you were devastated because you love that color green and you wanted it to look so nice on you as it did on your you know high school uh, prom, but it just wasn't the same. Or maybe you've had a situation where you were wearing your favorite pink bikini and your husband was at the beach with you and he was looking at another girl who was wearing a red bikini and you just felt so unnoticed and unappreciated. If so, I wanna introduce you to my new way to get in shape for the summer that's gonna fix all your problems and get you in shape, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the beginning of that, did you see how, how specific I was? It's too specific because the customer, or I should say potential customer, your prospect, your prospect can't put themselves into the story. So they might be going through and they might think, well, uh, yeah, I want to get in shape, but I didn't go to my high school prom. Yeah. Yeah. Or they might be reading. They may be like, like, yeah, I was, at, uh, uh, you know, with my husband, um, we were out at a, uh, on our, on a date night and we came back afterwards and he didn't want to have sex like usual. And I felt unattractive, but this beach bikini thing, like we live in Oklahoma, there's no beach. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. So what a master copywriter does is he lets the prospect fill in the blanks. So asking open-ended questions like, have you ever been in a, a situation where you tried on one of your favorite outfits and it just didn't fit the same way? Or maybe you noticed your husband it doesn't seem to look at you the same way anymore. And then they can be like, oh yeah, I did have my, my, you know, track suit from when I was uh, really athletic uh, and running, running marathons. And I tried to put that on and it didn't fit. But they can also say, oh yeah, I brought out my old business suit for my interview and it didn't fit. Yeah. Makes sense. And with the husband, they could say, yeah, well, there, there, this thing did happen at the beach with me. And another woman can go through that and say, yeah, we had this date night and my husband wasn't attracted to me. And another one can go through that and say, you know, my, my husband seems to be on his phone too much. I wonder if he's looking at other women on Instagram or whatever, you know, they can fill in the blank. So that is what separates the, the, um, the novice copywriters who speak at the customer versus those who speak with the customer and let the customer fill in the blanks and become a part of the story. Okay. So now do you recommend starting at like a pain point like that? You know, it's, it's a solid place to start mm -hmm. because the reason people buy for the most part is because they're trying to fix a problem. Yeah. Do, do you, do you uh, still use, you know, um, what, what, from what I know from copywriting, you know, there's like three levels, right? There's a problem, the agitation, the solution, and the testimonials or the social proof is that pretty much you know what you know uh what what is used right now these days as far as you know getting into the prospect's minds so that's an interesting point you break up about the problem and that then the agitation like agitating the problem yeah so yeah yeah so i don't i think that's the the that and i know that's going around and people are saying that that's what you should do i think that's the wrong way to look at it. okay I think that the problem needs to come 
with understanding. So you're not agitating, you're showing that you understand. Got it. So Wyatt Woodsmall, who's a brilliant psychologist, says that if you can explain somebody's problem to them better than they can, they will subconsciously credit you with having the solution. Yeah. So yeah. when I'm writing a piece, if I'm writing, let's say that, that uh, uh, in a woman, uh, woman's fitness product, as we just discussed, and I say, have you ever had the experience of having one of your favorite outfits not fit? or one of your, uh, uh, you know, big nights out with your husband and he didn't seem to be paying it as close attention to you. A woman's reading this and, and she's not saying, oh, I'm agitated. She's saying, oh, they get me. This, this person gets me. They understand what I'm going through. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the One Percenter Podcast. As in a token of my appreciation, I'm going to send you my free training video on productivity. All you have to do is message me the word time on Instagram. My Instagram handle is at Sam Bakhtiar or simply go to the show notes and click the link and message me the word time. So then they give you credit for being able to fix the problem. Yeah, it makes total sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. Now, I, you, see, I see copywriters making the mistake of like trying to turn up that pain. Yes. Too much. And that just scares people to be like, you're, you know, you notice your husband isn't paying attention. Then you start worrying he doesn't love you. Oh, oh, you really, oh, I'm just not a bikini model anymore. And, and you never will be again. And that, you know, you, you don't want to have plastic surgery, but you're never going to look like the sports illustrated swimsuit issue. And then the sports illustrated swimsuit issue keeps showing up at your house and you find your husband's porn collection. And it's just too much. <laughs> you know? it's just like, they're just like, fuck this. This is depressing me. No doubt. No doubt. A lot of copywriters make that mistake, man. of just like agitating and it just turns out. I appreciate you clearing that up, man. Because that's, that's what I've been taught over the years, you know, by, you know, by obviously I, I know that there's better solutions and, and all that. So, yeah. So do you, do you follow a formula or how does, how does that work in your mind? I don't follow a specific formula. And in fact, some of the most powerful things I've written have been unformula. Uh, I don't know what the word is. They don't look like anything else. They don't look like a traditional sales letter. I think there are some best practices that you need to follow. For example, I think you always need to let the customer know that you understand them. Yeah. I think you always need to give value. So what that means is leave them better than they find your advertisement. So if it were for women's fitness, for example, I'd probably teach them something. I'd teach them maybe some foods that they should avoid that they weren't thinking were bad for them or some exercises they can do at home you know, knowing that they'll still want to join the gym or they'll still want to get my video course that's going to show them even more exercises. So Eben, who's been, uh, you know, become my, my mentor since he hired me, calls this moving the free line. So back in the day, advertisements were really salesy and it was just all about buy now and you have 24 hours and you know, you'll get these bonuses, but they didn't give away anything. And these days, people are seeing 4,000 advertisements every single day. You know, I, I picked up my Facebook recently on the phone and I started scrolling to see how many advertisements they showed me in a minute in the newsfeed. If I just scroll for a minute and so I've hit the timer and it was eight advertisements. That's like an a, a advertisement in the feed like every seven something seconds, right? So you need to be able to cut through and value is the hot knife to cut through everyone else's advertising. If someone realizes that by watching your advertisement, they're going to learn something, yeah. then you're going to cut through and... Don't tell them they're going to teach you. Uh, you're going to teach something, and then don't, because then you'll break trust. Yeah. Do teach them something, and teach them something awesome. Don't teach them something they can go learn in Cosmo magazine or Women's Health or something like that. Teach them something innovative and brand new, and that gives you massive credibility. Because then they think, "Oh, wow, this person's giving me this thing for free. Imagine what the paid stuff is going to be. It's going to be a hundred times better." So how do you, how do you find the balance between like trying to get their attention, you know, seeing eight ads in a minute like that, but not being clickbaity? Yeah. So I think that the formula is curiosity of the, which is what clickbait ads do. They're like curious. Like I saw one yesterday. I, it actually got me to click. It was like 37 Hollywood stars who need to admit they're no longer famous. <laughs> that, that was pretty funny. So I had to see who they were, right? So that's like clickbaity is like pure curiosity. Curiosity plus benefit is the way to do it. And what is benefit? Benefit is value. Yeah. So someone asked me for an example of this recently, and I said, 
uh, what did I respond? I said, uh, three weird secrets every billionaire knows about saving money. And so it's clickbaity in a way because it does spark curiosity. What are these secrets that billionaires know? But it's a benefit because you're gonna show them these secrets. So when they click on it, you're gonna say what the secrets are. You know, maybe it's, uh, I don't know, hold every stock for at least 20 years to get the highest returns. Um, don't buy commercial real estate because, you know, places are going bankrupt, whatever it is, you know, but give them some real secrets. So it's not clickbait if you're adding value along with it. Yeah, okay, okay. Right. Now, now headlines, are headlines the most important thing? Absolutely, I mean, that's that's been, you know, the saying is that the headline is 80% of your ad, right? Because if you, they don't read the beginning, they're not gonna read the rest. However, the world has changed a little bit and a lot of ads now, there's no more reading, it's watching, you're watching a video. Yeah. So often today, it's not so much just like a single sentence, it's an idea. It's the idea that starts the video off. And I'll give you an example. So. Uh, I've done a lot in probiotics and if it was a, a traditional headline that was in a, a say a magazine ad for probiotics um, might say something like you know the the three ways to heal your gut that doctors aren't telling you you know like, well that's pretty interesting you know you're gonna you see the curiosity plus benefit is like you know curiosity is doctors aren't telling you these three ways to heal your gut the three ways the doctor's not telling you the curiosity. The benefit is the three ways. So you start reading the ad. That's what I would write if it was, uh, say, a magazine ad. But the video that I did has a doctor that is a business partner of mine. And he comes up and he says, hi, I'm Dr. Kerry Nelson. And even after 10 years of practicing medicine and doing my best to eat healthy, I found myself suffering from digestive issues. That's the idea. So what is that doing? Why will people keep watching that? Well, the target prospect is someone who has digestive issues, right? And someone who has digestive issues has probably tried a lot of things. So they see this doctor who says he also has digestive issues and he's been trying for 10 years to fix them. So they instantly feel understood by this doctor. He also has the credibility of having the doctor's coat on and the MD behind his name. So they think, okay, what happened next? And uh, actually we were just talking about Russell Brunson. So uh, I was talking with Russell around this mastermind table a few months ago and someone asked me my definition of copywriting. And I think my, my, uh, my, the way I see copywriting is showing that your product story can help your prospect story end better because they have this vision in their life of how their life story is going and how it's going to go the next few steps and how it's going to end. And your product has a story of how it was created and where it came from. And if they hear that story and they feel it's going to help their story have a happier ending, they're going to bring your product along board their story, right? In other words, they're going to buy your product. And so they hear this doctor's story. And they just want to know how it ends because if this doctor could fix his digestive issues, then they know that they could fix theirs. So it's massive curiosity benefit and a, a idea that also has some entertainment value because you're asking them to spend time watching a video. So you got to bake in all of those three things and it's much easier said than done. You know, for every video I write that's a success, I try many different openings, which is today's version of a headline that don't get people hanging on to watch the rest of the video, you know, but every once in a while you nail one, it's just perfect. And that's what happened with this one. And that was a huge success. Yeah. I love that. man. I love that. Do you, um, now if, if I'm a aspiring copywriter, cause as honestly, I, I like copywriting yeah. and I feel like I have, I have that beginning talent in it and I, I see myself going that. What advice would you have for someone to, to nurture that and to continue to develop that? Yeah, so you definitely got to read all the old school copywriting books. Everything the, reason why, 
you know, there's no, there's no new copywriting advice being given. I can tell you how some of the concepts from the 1900s transfer from text into video, because today it's video, back then it was text, but they're the same concepts. And people figured out how to sell to humans back in the early 1900s, you know? So the early copywriters that published books were uh, Claude Hopkins, uh, John Kennedy, um, Robert Collier, and then a, a few decades later, Eugene Schwartz, uh, after that, and Gary Halbert, Gary Bensavenga. So the psychology has not changed at all. And mastering the psychology will allow you to apply it to any medium, whether you're selling on the internet today or in 20 years, it's on VR, or AR, or on Mars, and you know, ads popping up and fucking Falcon X, Elon's rocket on the way over. You know? it's, it's like, it's all the same shit. Yeah. Because so, the, the psychology, man, is, is hard driven in, in, into humans. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's like one, one of the books, you know, that one of the greatest marketing books is, you know, Influence, you know, by Robert Cialdani. You know, it talks about six weapons that you can persuade people. And a lot of copywriters, you know, write, you know, use that, you know, the six weapons of influence to be able to- must read books. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so you, like, like you said, I think, you know, once you learn the psychology, because, you know, human psychology is not going to change. Yeah. Just the medium is going to change. Yeah. Now, what are, what are some of, um, of the biggest practices that you see most people doing? Like you said, being too specific um, in describing the problem. What are some of the other uh, bad things that you see a lot of copywriters doing or a lot of just salespeople in general? Yeah. I want to actually uh, tie that into more of an answer on your last question, too. Okay. So if you want to get great, you also got to write. You can't just read. Yeah. You got to write every single day. And that was one of the big things that Evan did for me because I was kind of a, a party animal, not too business minded, if you couldn't tell from me, you know, using the business to throw parties, right? So mm -hmm. I had a real, tra tra uh, real like trauma around consistency. I don't know what it was. I just like, e even in grade school, I never did homework. And that's why I graduated high school with a 1.7 GPA because I never got the reports done and shit. And so Evan dangled the carrot. He said, if you can write 10 pages of hard hitting copy every single day, I'll make sure you're making a hundred grand a year. And that would have been at the time for me, just, you know, falling out of control of money. Right. So that's what got me to sit down and write the 10 pages. And when I started writing those 10 pages every single day, that's when my growth curve just really rocketed. So I think uh, to answer your last question, and then I'll, I'll tie it into the, the next question. You got to do four things. You got to uh, immerse yourself in the knowledge, right? You got to write every day. And it really helps to have a mentor as well. So I was really fortunate to have Evan looking over my shoulder. I recommend people who want to get started in copywriting, go in house and work at a company as an entry level copywriter where you're immersed and you're learning it. And it's what you do every single day. We've tried to build an amazing copywriting program at Golden Hippo for young people to come in and learn. Uh, Agora Publishing has a great copywriting program if people are on the East Coast, you know, or, or a traditional ad agency, I think is is not quite as good, but hey, at least you're still immersed in the advertising world. And some of them are much better than others, you know? So if you're at Ogilvy and Mather, you know, David Ogilvy is famous for being a great copywriter. His agency's still around today, and I think they still do some direct response stuff. So those are the things, and then you gotta give yourself time, you know, because it's not, it's not an overnight thing. And it took me, I don't know, I mean, six months, as you guys know, to write something that got sent to the actual list that wasn't like edited <laughs> by someone else, and then, I still couldn't write those headlines, which are now more like openings for years, man. It probably took me, you know, four to five years before I could write consistent headlines that would grab people's attention. That's the hardest part. So, you know, practice uh, writing those headlines too. And don't put pressure on yourself to be an instantly great copywriter that's gonna be able to convert cold customers. You know, start out writing emails to, to warm customer lists yeah. or blog content or things like that, you know? so. Um, yeah, yes, the, the mistakes that copywriters make, uh, another one, I think getting into technicalities while people turn up the pain too much with agitation, I think they also go too hard in the closing. I think they try to close too hard and they try to use these scammy closing techniques that like, oh, you must yeah. buy now. PPPPS, yeah. PPPPPS. <laughs> Right. Yeah, you know, I like, I'm a fan of using the PS, but it's like the way you say it and what you say in it, you know? So 
some people will go really hard and agitating the pain when they close or the urgency or the scarcity. You know, you must buy this pill within 24 hours. And if you don't, not only are you going to miss out on the sale, but you might die because <laughs> you know, your body needs this pill. It's just like, it's too much. It's like, give me a freaking break, you know? So what I tell people when they're closing an ad, when they're coming to the part where you're going to ask someone for the order, stop thinking of that person as a prospect that you don't know. Remember, you're writing that one person that you wrote the autobiography for. So you're writing that one person. And now imagine that person is a member of your own family. Because let me ask you guys this. Have you ever had a member of your own family that had, you know, I know you guys are into health and fitness, like a health and fitness issue. Like maybe they were getting overweight to the point that they were going to be diabetic or something like that. You know, you knew it was affecting their long-term health. Yeah. So when you try to convince that person who's a member of your own family to take action for their health, it's a different way of speaking to them than, than being a salesman. Yeah. It's compassion. It's what I call compassionate closing. Cause you know what? When you're speaking to someone that you care about in a compassionate way, you actually close them harder than if you're speaking to a random person. Cause you really care. You want them to take that action. You're like, bro, you need to like start working out. You're going to like, like your life is, is your health is at stake. I want to keep you around. Like, I love you. Like you're my brother, you know, I need you to do this for your own health, for the family. You like, you close them harder than just some random person. We're like, you need to do this now or the offer is going to expire and you'll never see this page again. And, and all that, you know, and I don't have any problem with like any of these like specific lines, even that I'm saying, you know, I think it's good to have a, a limited time offer. And I think it's good to uh, have a, a uh, a price that is a special sales price. A more compassion rather rather than just you know rather than just like you know uh, sleazy methods. I, I love it. I, I love how you put that in. You know, imagine you're talking to your family member who's going through that. You know, and and compassion you know plays on emotion. And we know that if somebody wants to buy, you know, you know they buy, they buy based on emotion, not logic usually. Exactly, and I think that the prospect can feel it when you care because you're transferring that caring emotion into them instead of the inauthenticity where you're just trying to make a buck. Yeah. Feel that in the writing. It yeah. really can. Yeah. Now, are there any, uh, is, how, how important is the language? Is there, is there certain words or phrases that you stay away from? Or is there certain ways of putting things that you like better? Talk, talk to us about that. Hey, thank you so much for watching this episode of the One Percenter Podcast. Do me a favor. Take a screenshot that you're watching this podcast and tag me on Instagram at Sam Bakhtiar and I will repost it and give you a shout out. Yeah, so the most important part of language, especially if it's writing versus video, but equally you know, important in video depending on who the speaker is, is speaking in a way that's easy to understand. So there's apps that can tell what reading level your copy is at. And Gary Halbert, one of the greatest copywriters of all time, used to say you should strive to be at a sixth grade reading level or lower with your copy. And this was before the apps came out. He was typing on a typewriter or writing with a pen when he was writing his ads. You know, this is like pre-computers even. And he passed away, unfortunately, a, a few years back. But when he was, uh, when these apps came out that started to be able to, to grade you on readability and give you a grade assignment, Someone took all of Gary Halbert's sales letters and plugged it into the app. And they thought, okay, is Gary really writing at a sixth grade reading level? Because he's selling things like, you know, how to trade stocks and things that could appeal to a you know, more intelligent customer. They put his sales letters in. And you know what it said? It, it said, he, no, he was not writing at a sixth grade reading level. Third. Third grade. Yeah, I knew. Yeah, yeah, I knew. Yeah, I knew it was a third grade. Yeah, I, I, I had a fortune, you know, I was fortunate enough to meet Gary. You know, and, uh, you know, he's a great guy, man. You know, you know crazy sense of humor. That I could sometimes, you know, he'll say some stuff off the wall, man. He's, he's, he's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, man. I, I, I hear the stories. I'm, I got to have dinner with him once, but I was a shy kid. I just started out in the business. And I was sitting across from him, and I really didn't talk to him. You're, like, you're too nervous to say anything, right? You want to yeah. say something. You know, you want to say something. Yeah. Like, uh, you know. Yeah, it was a big group dinner, and we got to talk about like you know for a, a minute, but that was it. I was just too shy. Yeah. Do you do you ever get writer's block? How do you what? How do you deal with that? Or what advice would you give to someone if they just don't Great question? Yeah, don't know what. Yeah, to I definitely do. I mean, my toughest thing is really procrastination, and so 
start with research, start by reading a ton of articles. Um, you know, I, uh, I think uh, there's different trade magazines and things like that. You know, if you're into fitness or nutrition or, or finance, you know, just start by reading what the customer is reading to get in the, the state of the market, like where it's at. And that'll help you just get in the zone. And you have to be in the zone. For example, if you guys asked me to write a probiotics ad right now, I would blank because it's been you know months or years since I've written about probiotics. But at the time, I could tell you everything about probiotics, and I could tell you what probiotics were hot right now and which ones weren't. And you know, I knew what the state of the market was. So I'd say do the research, get the state of the market, and then the hack to using yourself is the Pomodoro technique, which is timed writing sessions. And this is a technique I got from Eugene Schwartz, one of the greatest writers of all time. And he says, you put a timer on for 33 minutes. And while that timer is going, you have your blank sheet of paper in front of you and you're allowed to write. You're allowed to stop and think, but you're not allowed to do anything else. You're not allowed to get up. You're not allowed to check your email. You're not allowed to check your phone. He was talking about before internet days, but you know, these days I think you got to have your phone on an airplane. You're out, you it off. You're out bro. And then after 33 minutes, take six minutes of break. And your six minute break, you, that's when you can check your email if you want, but be careful. It's a dangerous trap. You know, you make sure you're back. Yeah. But what I like to do during the six minute break is I'll do a set of push ups or some jumping jacks or something to get the blood flowing because the brain and body are connected. And we forget that because we're used to sitting in desks, you know, but you guys are fitness guys. You guys know that, you know. So the, the winning formula when I'm really crushing it is I'm doing 33 minutes on of writing, six minutes I'm doing some push ups, I'm doing some sit ups, and I'm back doing 33 minutes again. And then the hack for me, because I'm a procrastinator, is I notice sometimes it takes me a while to start the 33 minute session. Like I'll sit down and do my 33 minute session and two hours will go by and I'll have been like, look at every house on Zillow and uh, every fucking stock price I, you know, on, on the market. And I haven't started my 33 minutes. I'll say, okay, the first session is just going to be 10 minutes. And then I'll do 10 minutes and then I get the writing going because I trick myself to not thinking I'm committing to the full 33. And then when it's at like eight minutes, uh, you know, and two minutes left, I'll be like, I'll just extend it because I'll be in the zone by then. Okay. Yeah, like a low barrier of entry to kind of get the micro commitments. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Now I'm curious, man. I want to put you to the test. So, what would you title this interview? Oh man, that's a great, great call. So I need to know who your audience is to know how to title it. So, is your audience built around your fitness following and, and gym customers? So, or is it built around entrepreneurs. Just entrepreneurs. Just general entrepreneurs. You know, uh, you know, um, I would say. 18 to 30 year olds that, you know, they, they want to start a business or they have a, they have a business and they want to scale. Got it. Okay, cool. So uh, I think people know the value of copywriting now in that space. If they didn't, that'd be something to consider. But since they do, I think you can introduce it as copywriting secrets from, you know, I mean, I, I mean, since we're talking headlines here, you yeah. can go ahead. So don't, be, don't be shy. Don't be shy. Yeah. I want you. I, w I want you to you to, to say it. No, for so for 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 headline purposes, you can self you can aggrandize the shit on me. Yeah. You could say you know world's greatest copywriter reveals, uh, and then I would put something new that people don't know. So a lot of people are talking about. Uh, let's see, like well, how well, to copywriter. You know, learn copywriting. So you got to take it first. Overcoming writer's block. That could be good, but writer's block is not really as juicy as like true. world's greatest copywriter shows you how to like put seven figures in your bank account. That's so true. So true. My bad. That's why I'm not a copywriter. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that, but that's, that's unbelievable. <laughs> but this, is, this is actually, it's such a great question. That's unbelievable. Put seven figures in your bank account. It's unbelievable. It sounds like a number pulled out of thin air. It sounds like bullshit. So what is something tangible uh, that also I haven't said on every other podcast and other copywriters aren't talking about. So just thinking about the things that we covered today, one of the things that we covered today and went pretty in depth upon was video openings. And that's something that everybody in today's world wants to know. So uh, I'll tell you another proof element that you can add is I've had videos that have gotten a hundred million views. I'll make your video sell. I don't know, man. Well, so the proof element that I've had videos that haven't gotten a hundred million views, you could put something like, you know, world's greatest copywriter reveals 
uh, video starting methods that have gotten him billions of views or, or 100 million views on a single video or something like that, you know? And I just write these things down rough and then I finesse them in yeah. to, to making them tighter. You know, it's, it's easier to say them broad and then refine them when you're actually writing. You know, but I think that's a good hook because then they're thinking, okay, world's greatest copywriter. I got to hear what he has to say. Oh, this is specifically about how to open video, how to grab attention with video. I'm doing video. My videos are not getting as many views as I want. They're not getting as many sales as I want. That's something I can use. And it's not like, it's not like air, like he's going to teach you how to make a million dollars. That sounds like bullshit. Yeah. But then they're going to fill in the blank for themselves. They're going to think, hey, if I know how to open videos, I'm going to be able to make a ton of money using these video opening secrets. Yeah. yeah. I love that, like the way your mind works to get there. You know, it's it's it, it's like the back door. It's, you know, it's just a skill too. It's like yeah. he's done so much. You know, he's he's done it so much that it just comes automatically with him. You know, he just he. Well, you know, that's a, a great way to think and describe it is what's the back door. But actually, the way I think of it is like most people are going to think of like what's the obvious front door. So the obvious thing I think with this interview, the obvious way people would try to be, be like world's greatest copywriter teaches you how to add seven figures to your business. That's like obvious, right? But it's so obvious it's overdone and it just sounds like bullshit. That's what we would have done. I'm sure. Yeah. That's what I, that would that would be exactly <laughs> what we talked to you. That, that would have been the headline, man. We probably well, have that's what everybody does. Yeah, right? we know we probably I'll have right back. Because that's what it, that's what everyone wants, right? Is they want to make a bunch of money and have the security of freedom that comes with it. But how do you let them fill in that blank themselves? Like we were talking earlier, you know, you don't talk about fitting into the prom dress, you talk about uh, trying on your favorite outfit, it doesn't fit. You know, you don't wanna be too specific, you wanna let them fill in the blank. So if you give them a step in your headline that's gonna let them fill in the blank, which is world's greatest copywriter shows you how to grab people's attention in, in, in any video, then they're gonna fill in the blank and they're gonna be like, ah, if I could grab someone's attention in any video, I could increase my reach in these videos, which would increase my sales, which would increase the money in my bank account. You know, so widening it back and thinking the non-obvious thing that is more believable that is going to let them fill in the blank so they put in their ultimate result. Because for some people also, it might not be the seven figures. You know, like let's say take a guy like Tom Bilyeu or whatever. Uh, you know, he actually, uh, Tom's a great example because Tom is already rich. He doesn't need seven figures. But what's he doing? He's making movies. And You guys know Tom? Are you familiar yeah, with Tom? Okay, so Tom made it, you know, uh, Quest Bar built a billion dollar brand, sold it, made a bunch of money. And now he's all about impact. He's making comic books and movies. And he wants people to read his comic books and watch his movies. And something for him, he could fill in the blank. If you're talking about how to cr craft any video so people can't stop watching it, they're like, oh, that's something he would want to know. That's something the guy who needs to make his first million would want to know. That's something a girl who wants to get her first million fans on uh, her fashion blog would want to know. It's just anyone can fill in the blank for what it's going to do for them. I love that. I love that. The best person I've seen do video ads is Billy Jean. Uh, I'm curious, what's, what's your take on his style of ads and how, like, just, just talk about his style and how, how kind of people can do that for themselves. Cause, cause I know video ads, like we've, we've done a couple and they're hard, you know, just rather than being just straight up yeah. about the product, but his are entertaining and his, I want to watch, you know? So yeah, I'm actually, I, I know who Billy Jean is and I've heard he's a great advertiser, but I'm not familiar with his ads personally. Okay. Okay. Well, you honestly, you definitely need to check him out. He's done like a couple of Wolf of Wall Street stuff or like a couple of Taken and he'll like create scenes from the movies with his product. And I sit there and Google his ads because I want to watch them. So, oh, nice. I'll check him out after this. Yeah, absolutely, man. But I, I appreciate this because this was definitely, this was, this was good. This was amazing. Yeah, this was helpful, man. I appreciate this so much. It just reminded me how much I suck at copywriting. It, just, <laughs> I, I, I was good. It, was like, it just reminded every time, man, I was like, I talked to this one, I'm like, man, that's why I don't do that. You know, that's, that's so I would say like two keys is like, like it's about the basics but then don't be basic so think of the basics of psychology and then don't do the same shit everyone else is doing the first thing that you think about is probably the same thing everyone else thinks about so think about how to like wind it back yeah. and, and yeah. have a fresh yeah. approach well thank you so much for being on the show i know all these viewers are going to get a ton, tons of value from this and like you're saying, they're going to get those video views so guys uh, thank you so much for tuning in um you're craig on instagram right yeah, just at Craig on Instagram or uh, on Twitter. I post a lot uh, more uh, like ad, ad, content around advertising and, and things like that. My Instagram is more inspirational. My Twitter is just my full name, Craig Clemens. Okay. C-L-E-M-E-N-S, like Roger Clemens, a baseball player.
Awesome, guys. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Go follow Craig. Go consume his content. It's going to help you guys. And we'll see you guys next week. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, guys. It was a blast. Great talking to you. Hey, guys. If you liked today's episode, do me a huge favor. Go ahead and leave a comment below. Subscribe to the channel. Leave me a review. And tag a few friends that you think can benefit from what we share today. Really appreciate it. God bless.